Hey guys, let's talk Bell & Ross Vintage Collection. Is it worth your time? Is it worth your dough? Let's do it. I have here in my hand the Bell & Ross BRV292 Aero Noval. The Vintage Collection watches, all of them kind of have overarching features and so this is going to be kind of the watch base that I'm going to be using to discuss the brand and the collection as a whole. So who exactly is Bell & Ross? Well Bell & Ross is a Paris based company relatively new uh, among the watch players but they've, they've gained a lot of steam over the years and their claim to fame really are the aviation inspired timepieces you know these really square bulky um, watches that really make uh, a person's hand stand out and uh, have a picture of some of these here you can see uh, the claim to fame and you may recognize some of these the likes of Robert Downey Jr. Uh, owns a Bell & Ross very similar to this one or the one the square pilot watches rather and so you know, they, they're, gain, they're gaining traction, but let's be honest. If you're looking for high engineering, high innovation, or true watchmaker type of company and watch and, and heritage, you're not going to find it here. Um, they're much closer to a design, fashion, watch kind of company. And in my opinion, they do it quite well, but at an astronomical cost. This watch here retails, and the steel bracelet, which we will review as well, for about $3,500 USD. And let's assume on the gray market you can get it for around $2,500. So let's, let's slap a $3,000 price tag on this watch just to average them out. And we're going to review its merits based off of that 3 k That kind of puts it in the Tag Heuer lower Breitling range. Um, of watches. So let's do the good, the bad, the ugly. Off the bat, the good, it's a good looking watch. Bell & Ross's vintage collection is kind of their take to addressing, you know, the common man's uh, watch tastes because not everyone can pull off that giant brick on their wrist. And so they've taken vintage elements from back in the day and modernize them, you know, replacing the acrylic with sapphire crystal, you know, upping the case diameter from, you know, the lower 30s to 41 millimeters here, which is true for the chronographs as well. And so those are some of the things I really like about this watch. First off, it's what call, what Bell & Ross calls the ultra domed sapphire crystal. Man, you can just see that distortion you can see how the light plays with it and even affects the sunburst dial effect there. And I really don't take that adjective ultra lightly because in seeing other boxed dome sapphire crystal watches, they really just don't have quite the curvature that Bell & Ross displays here. And so it really does capture that romantic time period where, you know, acrylic watches were, were in fashion. I also like this small date window uh, design feature here. It's really subtle and it kind of disappears when you don't want it, which allows you to keep a symmetrical view of the watch. But then when you really do need it, that functionality is there. So I think that is a really nice design cue. And I, I don't, haven't seen any watches do it prior to Bell & Ross, but I may be wrong. The bezel is rotating but it is also bi-directional, which I actually think this is a plus. This is an aviation piece, a bi-directional bezel is not a problem because you're not diving with it. And, you know, realistically, you're just going to be using this bezel as a timer stopwatch function anyways. So I, I do like that bi-directional movement of the bezel and it, and it does feel and sound very nice. It still does have a 100 meter water resistance rating as well as a screw down crown and so this is kind of a nice daily beater surf and turf kind of watch if this is what you're looking for has a crown guard as well 
So obviously this is an aftermarket brown leather uh, strap that I bought, but it normally does come with this bracelet, which I will say looks good. I, I like that it's different from the typical Rolex Oyster bracelets that everyone has. It has a twin trigger release um, clasp system and it has a nice snap to it, so it's very secure. It does have a micro adjustment functionality as well. But I must admit, it doesn't quite have the sub substance of an Omega steel bracelet. And, and you can tell, uh, you can very quickly tell the difference between this and, and the likes of a Rolex and Omega bracelet. So for $3,000, you're kind of getting what you're paying for, um, if not maybe even a little bit less. So everything sounds great so far, you know, this is a good looking watch, you know, you have a decent bracelet, you have some, the features are there. Um, why do I, did I mention that this is an overpriced watch? Well, can't speak too soon because in the end we want to see what's in the watch itself. So I'm going to take off the bracelet and review to you the open case back here. You can see it's super simple, has the Bell & Ross logo stamped on the rotor. This is what Bell & Ross calls their BR Caliber 302. And I take an issue with this because they make it sound like it's some kind of in-house developed movement, you know, of engineering Bell & Ross standard. But in reality, this is a Salita based movement. And Salita, you know, basically being a copycat uh, of ETA movement. So this is a copycat of a copycat of a copycat of a movement. And Bell and Ross on their end have done very little changes to the movement. Uh, from testimony I've heard that they've regulated it to keep slightly better time than out of the box Salita movement, you know, but minimal additional finishing minus the different rotor um, when comparing this in pricing to Tag Heuer, you know, even Tag Heuer, who gets all this trash talk from snobs, at least, you know, tries to regulate, add some kind of proprietary technology to it, or even add some finishing to the movement to at least make it a Tag Heuer branded movement. Um, they really dropped the ball on this one. And, and I think the movement itself really... Um, is on the level of that of maybe even lower than that of Hamilton and Needles and the, the lower quality, you know, $100 um, low tier swatch group brands. So that's my biggest issue, you know. Out of the box movement, you know, 40 hours, hacking hand wine, you know, hacking seconds, but nothing much more than that. So. Is it worth it? Objectively, no. Um, this is a watch that, you know, is probably on par in, from technical and objective standpoint to a Hamilton that you can buy for a couple hundred bucks. So, you know, at the $3,000 price point, you know, it really makes me struggle on why you would want to buy this instead of saving up for an Omega. But subjectively, you know, this does have some pretty charming aesthetic features that, you know, really made it hard to say I'm never going to want this watch and that I don't want this watch. The price is, is, is really high, but when you're looking at a watch as a jewelry or as an accessory um, and not as some kind of engineering, you know, tool, then, you know, if you like it, then why not buy it? And if you have the dough, especially. So Bell & Ross Vintage Collection, not worth it objectively. Subjectively, it might be the one for you.